Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to War in the Pacific Admirals Edition, our play-by-email Let's Play series, playing against XTRG. We are into late, well I guess late January, almost, maybe mid-January of 1942, it is January 19th, and uh, so far the war is, it's a bit of a mixed bag, right? We're playing as the Allies, XTRG is the Japanese, and given that fact, uh, we're struggling because the Japanese have vastly superior forces, both in quality and in some cases in quantity. And so we're trying to do what we can to hold up the Japanese advance. XTRG has really been focusing heavily on a drive in the South Pacific. He's landed a division of soldiers at Rabaul. He's landed troops as far south as New Caledonia. Uh, he's on the verge of taking the rest of New Caledonia. And that will put Australia proper into bombing range of the Japanese military. And so uh, the war is not going great. But it's not yet dire. I think the situation is man manageable. We have sunk a Japanese battleship. I can't remember if he sunk any of ours at Pearl, but he really didn't sink much of anything. Maybe you can see a troop transport getting hit by a, a torpedo off uh, Fiji. Um, but really, he hasn't hit much in the way of any of our uh, heavy warships. We sank one of his battleships. We damaged at least two more battleships, one with a torpedo, one with a gun battle off New Caledonia. And we also uh, put a torpedo into a heavy cruiser of his. So, I mean, we've done some damage to the Japanese uh, the Japanese Navy, uh, which has helped to offset some of these defeats. Additionally, uh, he's really not yet begun to reduce Bataan. He's not yet begun to reduce Singapore. And we're moving toward the end of January of, of 1942. So, you know, Bataan's got a long way to go to get to the historical uh, point at which it fell. Uh, but at least in the case of Singapore, you know, all we have to do there is hold out, what, another two weeks and we'll, uh, we'll replicate history? Or, or is it four weeks? I'm not sure. But in either event, um, you know, we're doing okay, I think. Uh, not great, but okay. We've, we've butchered a lot of Japanese uh, bomber crews, which is a great thing for us, uh, both in airframes and in quality. That should have hurt his uh, army bomber cap capacity, and we've seen that on the Malay Peninsula. Um, and this turn should have some interesting things. I made a lot of uh, orders to various units. It was a pretty active turn for my own... Uh, turn that I'm about to send back to XTRG. I actually had Belugan take a look at it uh, from uh, Belugan campaign and from Warfare Sims. Uh, he didn't make any changes to the save, but he did take a look at the save and kind of give me some uh, pointers or tips, and so uh, we may talk about a little bit of that as we get into the episode. But um, you can see here, not a super involved turn. There's some bombing going on in China. There's been some submarine activity, although uh, apart from the lone troop transport that was sunk, not a ton has occurred. Um, I did learn that uh, next month in February, uh, a certain type of our cargo ship will be able to be converted to troop transports, which should be nice uh, because we frankly don't have enough troop transports uh, for some of the things we need to do. I'm also planning on reinforcing uh, s um, New Zealand. Uh, we're also going to be sending some reinforcements to Australia. So knowing that the fall of New Caledonia is nigh, I think the thing we need to do is we need to make sure that Japan isn't able to easily take uh, New Zealand and that they're not e able to easily take Australia because those are kind of the, the large, um, obvious targets for them next. We've already fortified the most immediate islands to New Caledonia, uh, that being Fiji and Pago Pago. So now that we've gotten those islands secured... The big victory point locations are in Australia and in New Zealand, and if XTRG is going for the auto victory, as he seems to be doing, uh, then we'll need to make sure that we put up a fight there and inflict some pretty heavy casualties on him. Um, I think if he does go for New Zealand, that would be interesting, because that's a very rare thing. People pretty much never, Japanese players pretty much never get to New Zealand. And I wouldn't say it's because we're doing an, you know, and I don't even know if he's going to go that route. Uh, some of the Japanese players do make it to Australia, but New Zealand is so far south. It's so far out there. It's so far on the edge of uh, Japan's logistical capabilities that uh, it's it's a pretty rare objective. Now, that being said, XTRG has proven himself willing to jump way out beyond uh, his own supply lines. So I'm kind of expecting it. I mean, I don't have any real intelligence indicating that he will. Um, but, you know, I thought he was going to go for Fiji. I thought he was going to go for Pago Pago. He did go for New Caledonia. Um, the logical step, I think, would be to go to Fiji. But 
every time I guess what the logical step is, it seems like I'm always wrong. And he seems to overextend himself in every situation. So I kind of hope he goes for New Zealand because I think it would be an interesting, um, you know, an interesting move. I was talking to Belugan about it, and he's kind of like, yeah, it, it's probably unlikely. He's probably going to put bombers on New Caledonia, hit Australia, hit the industry there. You know, the tactic you need to do is pull a lot of your troops back off the coast and then set them to strategic mode so that whenever he does land in Australia, you can just race your reinforcements to the beach in a matter of days and quickly bog him down and prevent him from really gaining a beachhead. Um, but, you know, he uh, he could go to, to Fiji. I was talking to Newhauser, and Newhauser's pretty convinced that he's going to go to Fiji. So, you know, Belugan thinks Australia's the logical the logical target. Uh, Newhauser thinks that Fiji's the logical target. Um, but I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see if he moves on Lord Howe Island and Norfolk Island because that would indicate an intent to move further south. He hasn't moved on either of those. I have no reason to believe that he will. But they're also both undefended, so we'll have to see how this all plays out. Meanwhile, uh, he has advanced to Changsha. He has launched a bombardment attack there. Bombardment attack failed. Our troops are pretty well dug in, and we have reinforcements on the way. So uh, this is a huge Japanese attack force here in central China, but uh, Changsha may be the decisive battle in central China that we really need to try and hang on to. And as long as we can hang on at Wang Chao, the longer... Um the longer we can hang there and the more damage we can do there, the better for us. He's just continuing to bombard. He hasn't tried to attack again yet. Which I think is actually good for us because we're working on rebuilding the fortifications there. Uh, meanwhile, in Rabal, the 56th Japanese Infantry Division attacks there. And you can see they did take the city and they did drive our troops back uh, there. The, we lost heavy casualties. He lost a few, but we lost pretty heavy casualties there at Rabal. Um... That's the thing, that's about it. So Rabal falls, that's kind of to be expected with a whole Japanese division there. And then uh, some bombardment activity in China, but not a lot going on there, so um, we'll see. With that being said, let's go ahead and step back and I'll uh, give this a break and we'll jump back in and I'll talk to you a little bit about Australia, New Zealand, and Fiji uh, to see what might make sense. Okay, so we're back into our game, and let me talk to you a little bit about the South Pacific, because that's where it seems like the majority of the fighting is going on, uh, the majority of the battles, etc. We've lost spot, we've lost sight of all the Japanese shipping around the island of New Caledonia, probably because more or less all of our transport aircraft or our, our recon aircraft are now down for repairs, and we don't have any aviation support there to get them back up to um, to action. So right now we have no visibility on where the Kidu Butai is, last couple of turns, it was somewhere around here. Uh, we're not sure if it's pulling back or what it's doing, but we know it's in this general vicinity, or we think it is, uh, at least the last we saw. So there's that. Um, we know that he's going to go for the rest of New Caledonia. He's going to go for Nomaya. We don't have a lot that can stop him. We've got about 172 assault strength. The majority of that is uh, in the form of militia. Uh, we only have level 2 fortifications. This place will probably fall pretty quickly like Comac, but again, it's going to probably take a few more days for his soldiers to move from Lafoa to Nomaya. We also have the advantage that this is jungle terrain, so the 2 fortification plus, times 2 basically for the uh, for the terrain modifier should help us a little bit um, but we'll see if it, you know if he has a strong force which I think we had some recon there and that he has uh, you know 10,000 plus troops no Maya is gonna fall so New Caledonia is gonna fall so I was talking to you a little bit about New Zealand I have no reason to believe he's going for New Zealand except for my own intuition XTRG throughout this entire series has been someone who really jumps out at the fringes, right? He landed on Canton Island. He landed on Baker Island. Just out of the blue, way out in advance, before he had taken Vataput, before he had taken Funafuti, before he had taken anything out here. He just landed here. I don't even think he had taken Tarwa yet. Just way on the extreme of the supply, supply positions. He did something similar with Midway. Pretty strong force, he even brought the Kadubutai into Midway to take Midway for the Japanese, which is interesting because it's not really worth all that much for the Japanese from a victory point perspective, but I digress. He also jumped way out there and took Savi. He took some casualties. He took some uh, losses to cruisers of ours because he kind of overextended himself, but again, at the end of the day, he took Savi from our forces. 
these none of these were strong points. These all were almost like Pacific Island campaigns for the Americans, right? We know the Japanese are strong here, so we're going to hit them here. We know the Americans are strong here, so we're going to go here because we know they don't have anything there. They were very clearly aimed at going at undefended areas. So when he started moving in that direction, I said, all right, we are going to build the Fiji line. We're going to fortify Pago Pago. We're going to fortify Fiji. We're going to fortify New Caledonia. Fast forward a couple of weeks. He made his move. He made his move on New Caledonia. Now, at the time, he had taken Savi. He had taken uh, Vaidapup. He had taken Funafuti. He, his general axis of advance was directly south on Fiji. Fiji seemed like the most logical place for him to go. From a victory point perspective, Fiji is worth a large amount of victory points, 825 victory points for Fiji. Um, Nomai is worth a lot to the Allies, 300, but it's not worth a ton to the Japanese. In fact, New Caledonia is not worth much at all to the Japanese, only about 30 for uh, Nomaya and 2 for Comac. It's really not worth all that much. But it was the weakest of the three islands. Pago Pago is might be the strongest at 334 assault value with a, and two American regiments, the 34th Infantry and the 8th Marine Regiment, along with some other units. Then in terms of defense, uh, Suva is probably the strongest base. Well, maybe not even. It's a 294 defense. Uh, it has one New Zealand brigade on it and has one American Infantry brigade or regiment on it. And then you have Nadi, which is probably the weakest of the bases on Fiji, but it is connected via road to Suva. Don't let these assault values fool you. If you actually click on a lot of these units, most of these Australian units are militia units. So even though they have a high assault value, they're actually kind of paper tigers if you look into it. So these were all strong, 300 plus assault value. And where does he land? He lands at Nomaya. Nomaya is less than half the strength of any of those other bases, 172. So he picked the weakest spot in our defensive line. Now, what does that mean, right? We think he's going for an auto victory. Based on his strategy, it certainly seems to be that he's going for an auto victory. He's jumping way out ahead, trying to capture as much as he can, high victory point values, racing out way beyond what his logistical support really is. Well, New Caledonia can be a couple of things. One, it could be a bombing base, right? He could base GM3, GM4 bombers, and he could hit the Australian East Coast. He could probably hit Brisbane, Mayborough, Bundesburg, Rockhampton, Newcastle, maybe Sydney. It's a little bit of a, a long flight there, but theoretically he could do that. He could also dominate Fiji to the east. So it's a good land-based aircraft carrier that he could, he could strike out from. But it was also the least well defended. So now at this point, what's his option? He has taken New Caledonia, but in doing so, he's also delayed further. He has seen multiple troop transports of ours over on Fiji, and he has sunk multiple troop transports, including a troop transport just last turn, at Fiji. So he knows we have probably reinforced Fiji. One must assume that he thinks we have heavily reinforced Fiji. So now his options, if he moves to the east, are attacking a heavily fortified Fiji, which will take time and will slow him down. He will win, but it will bog the Kidubutai down. It will prevent him mo from moving against the Dutch East Indies. It will tie down probably a division plus of Japanese troops. So probably everything he needs to capture New Caledonia outside of the garrison he'll leave. He'll need to transfer to Fiji, and he may have to take a portion of that division that just took Rabaul down to move to Fiji. Meanwhile, if he moves on to Australia, he needs even more than that. He probably needs two to three full-blown Japanese infantry divisions plus support units to go for Australia. I don't think that's even remotely feasible at this time, so I'm not too worried about that. So New Caledonia could act as a bombing base for Australia, but I don't think this is his southernmost advance. I don't think he's going to stop here. I also don't think that he's just going to magically jump to Fiji because, again, he knows that's where our strength is. So he can do a couple of things. He could take some of these nearby bases, which will probably fall anyway, uh, that have a theoretical air capacity of up to five on both Tana and Ifate. But at the end of the day, they're not really worth anything. They don't really do much for him. I mean, in theory, yes, maybe they, they allow him to strike out at Fiji better and reduce it better, but that's a long play. That's a Guadalcanal play. And they don't really do a lot to bring him to, to, to auto victory, right? He'd be eating up a quarter of the year probably doing that, running that campaign. He could move in toward Sa Savu Savu, uh, which is not really worth anything in terms of victory points. Uh, it does have a dot base there, which is level 5, but it isn't even a level 1 base yet, so it would take him some time to build up. Also, it's so close to Fiji 
any air elements here would hamper him, and he basically have to keep the Kidubutai in here to prevent us from bombing him into oblivion. Uh, you know, he has to keep the Kidubutai there the entire time, just setting up a, a, a contrary base. He could build up Sabi, but again, he, Pago Pago is right next door, and he knows we've been building up on Pago Pago as well, because he's seen many ships there. So he knows that Pago's strong, he knows that Fiji's strong. There's these other bases he could try and move around and flank us at, at Tonga, Tuhu, Ivu, or Vuvai, but those are all low victory point bases. You know, two, one, two, uh, you know, two. And again, it's going to take time. These are all underdeveloped bases. None of these have like even a level one airfield. Some of them have re reasonable capacity, but they don't have ports. They don't have airfields. There's it's, Any play toward Fiji is a two to three month venture. Any play toward Australia is a six plus month venture. So what can he do here? If we assume, and everything that he's been doing has to indicate to us that we should assume, if we assume that XTRG is going to stay on the offensive, then what can he do? Well... He can attack somewhere else. He can go to the Dutch East Indies, which is, I think, what he should do. But he for he hasn't done it yet. So he's made no real play toward the Dutch East Indies. He could go to Port Moresby. We're preparing for that eventuality. We've got only 180 assault value there, but we are building up fortifications. We do have some reinforcements here. We've got a reasonable amount of supply. Um, but he could go for Port Moresby. I mean, it's, a, it's pretty valuable to the Japanese, 280. Uh, maybe that's what the Assault and Rabaul will eventually do for him. Uh, may get him there. Um, but yeah, he could go that direction. But again, what does Port Moresby do? It, it basically, it doesn't help him cut off Australia because it's further north. It does help him bomb some of the northern Australian bases. It could ask for act as a springboard for Australia. But I don't think, at least not at this stage, I don't think that XTRG is thinking of an offensive on Australia. I just don't. How many divisions can he bring to bear? Probably not that many. He hasn't reduced Bataan yet. He hasn't reduced Singapore yet. He hasn't taken the Dutch East Indies. Until he does all of those things, he's not going to have a huge number of divisions available to him. So if he can't do that, I mean, I suppose he could launch out uh, eastward toward Christmas Island, Palmyra, uh, Johnston Island, or whatnot. But he's seen a lot of troop transports around Johnston Island. He's sunk a bunch of them. So he probably thinks, and we really haven't, but he probably thinks our defenses there are much stronger than they really are. So if that's true, and not to mention Johnson Island doesn't really do much for him. It is valuable, Japanese, 250. Uh, could act as a springboard for an offensive on, on Pearl Harbor, but again, that's a long-term play. That's not something that's going to be easy. So I think what he may end up doing, and I already have troops on, on route, uh, en route. I, I issued the order uh, three or four turns ago to send troops to Norfolk Island and to Lord Howe Island. In fact, I have them at sea, well, at least one of the islands. These guys over here. So these guys are going to Norfolk Island, the 34th Combat Infantry Regiment. They've got like a 70 assault value, and they um, are also uh, an engineer unit, so they can build it up for air units. So they are on their way. They've been at sea for about th two, three days? Three days, it looks like. Uh, they left Pearl Harbor, yeah, it's at least three days, maybe four days. So we sent them out a while ago, right? Like almost a week ago in game terms. And we have them going, going toward Norf Norfolk Island. The logic here was that, okay, New Caledonia is going to fall. We have the defenses here at Fiji. We have the defenses here at Pago Pago. But we have no further defensive line to the south. The south is open. Norfolk Island, Lord Howe is open. So I think what the, and both of these are reasonable air bases as well, right? He can build up level three here. He can build up level three here. But what's but the concern I have is if we lose Norfolk Island, if he does strike out south toward Norfolk or toward Lord Howe, first off, both these bases are unmanned, so he can take them easily. Second off, they are within air range of New Zealand. Third off, unlike Australia, I have no air units in New Zealand. I have barely any ground units. You can see Auckland here's total assault value is 180. The northernmost base is 20. The other bases are basically just non-existent 72 there uh 29 here uh wellington is a little bit better defended it's at uh 269 so wellington might be able to and I, in fact i should set these guys to strat move so that way we can if he does land they can move to the why can't this guy strat move i guess oh he's a coastal defense so he's stuck there um but we can we can set these guys to strat move so they can rapidly race forward 
and reinforce uh, elements uh, as, uh, as, as it becomes necessary. But we basically have no troops in New Zealand. So there's no troops in Norfolk Island or Lord Howe Island. That would be the logical place for him to strike south. Norfolk is not worth a lot, neither is Lord Howe. But they would allow him a springboard, especially Norfolk, to New Zealand. So we are reinforcing Norfolk. We issued that order, like I said, several days ago. Um, but if that's the key, right? So like once Nomaya falls, the question is, what does he do next? Does he move toward Norfolk? If he does, then New Zealand is definitely the target. So to that end, I don't know if New Zealand's the target or not, but in discussion with uh, Belugan, he basically said, hey, listen, I usually base the aircraft carriers at New Zealand as well because it's a nice a nice sort of central location. You've got interior lines. You can, you can move in a lot of different directions. And so he recommended using New Zealand as sort of this uh, center point in the defensive arc. So what we're doing there, because we have very few defenses there, is in the event that XTRG does move there, we are going to be moving a tank regiment, an inf a marine regiment, and a base force regiment, and a paratrooper battalion all down to New Zealand. So that'll give us about 200 assault value, plus the 700 or so, or actually, sorry, 26, 180, uh, 54, about 500. So well, that'll add to about the 500 assault value in New Zealand. If they get there... Uh, then the, it'll have about 700 assault value with about 200 of that being very good American equipment. So that would really mean he'd have to deploy probably two divisions to take New Zealand, which kind of gets into Australia territory, which it's just, I think it's unlikely. Um, but it's going to take the better part of a month to get there. So long-winded way of me saying I'm worried about New Zealand because it's so vulnerable, um, but... Right now, I think the real question, and I think what we need to really figure out, is what does XTRG do? Because he's about to take New Caledonia. Australia doesn't seem realistic. It's going to take a couple of weeks to build up airfields here on New Caledonia to hit Australia, let alone bring down GM-3 or GM-4 bombers. His Sally bombers have already kind of been ravaged. Um, and we have fighter defenses in Australia as well. Does he want to move toward Fiji? Because that's going to be a protracted campaign. He showed no desire for that. Does he want to move to the, toward the Dutch East Indies? That would probably be the smart play, but I, you know, even if he does that, I still need to reinforce my defensive perimeter. So to that end, I'm going to be re bringing reinforcements down to New Zealand, and I'm going to be hoping that he turns toward the Dutch East Indies. Because I don't know if he will or not, but uh, it's what I would do, because you need that oil, right? And uh, so far, he hasn't. Now, that being said, uh, we are pulling most of our troops back into Singapore, um, we haven't all gotten there yet. We've only got about 370 in assault die on Singapore. We've got about 680 at Johar Bahru. Uh, and we also have some modern fighters that we've brought into Singapore as well. So I did bring that squadron that had been shipped overseas to Palembang. I brought in at least the elements of that are, that are ready. So we have 11 hurricanes. I also am upgrading the 488th Royal Air Force Squadron, which had buffaloes. We're upgrading them to Hurricane 2B Trops. Uh, so that'll be a massive upgrade. So once those are all repaired and ready, that'll be 23 hurricanes, plus there's another five coming from Palembang. So that'll be, uh, I think it's 28 hurricanes. Uh, I consolidated one of my P-40 squadrons with six P-40s into the 24th, 17th pursuit group. So that's now up to 12 P-40s. And then I think in the next couple of, in the next day or two, I will have more than 25 P-39 Aero Cobras in our uh, inventory, so I will swap out one of the P-40 squadrons there as well. So we should end up with 25 P-39s, uh, 21 P-40s, uh, and then we'll have some 20 or 28 um, uh, Hurricanes. So 28 Hurricanes, 25 uh, P-39s brings us to 53, 21 uh, P-40s brings us to 71. We're also bringing back our AVG squadron, so we've got 12 currently at Sing Kang, uh, and then we've got an additional three that are, or, sorry, an additional six that are uh, moving in that direction. So we should have about 100 modern fighters at Singapore inside about two to three days, uh, plus an additional uh, 25 to 26 Buffalo. So we'll have about 100 to 126 fighter aircraft at Singapore to resist any further bombing raids and really strengthen our forces there. So that's really our objective there. Um, in addition to that, sort of the strategic priority is since the Fiji line's kind of broken with New Caledonia, we're going to reinforce New Zealand and Norfolk Island to build a new defensive perimeter that kind of angles south. So if XTRG does continue south, then we do that. The other thing that I also want to point out is if he does do that, that's going to leave him a real... The one thing that's in the back of my mind, the one thing that Belugan and, X and Neuhauser are both saying is unlikely that, that XTRG would drive south, that far south 
is if he does that, if he does not win the war, any troops he have there just instantly become a prison colony because they're going to be stuck there. And once the Allied forces start getting strong in six to seven to eight to ten months, he will have no hope of holding those troops. They're just too far south, too exposed. And taking New Zealand probably doesn't give him enough victory points for an auto victory by itself. So he's probably got to take New Zealand. He's probably got to take Fiji. He's probably got to take the Dutch East Indies. I don't know. You know, it's it seems like a risky gambit, but I guess the, the, the thing that scares me is it's my weakest point. And every time that XTRG has done anything, he has struck at my weakest point. So to, to remedy that, we're building up Norfolk Island, we're building up New Zealand, and we've already built up Fiji, and we've got a substantial number of troops in Australia. So we've got that going for us. Meanwhile, at Bataan, we're at 51,000 supplies still. We've got another 300 supplies that are going to come in for Boswanga, assuming that there's no interception there. We pull the 330 supplies out of this uh, port. We're sending them to Bataan. Additionally, we've got about 1,000 supplies that are going to be coming in from Tarkin once this transport gets loaded up. So hopefully we can bring the supplies back up to around uh, 53,000. We'll continue to eat through that supply over time, but really the hope is that we can kind of keep sneaking in small amounts of supply to Bataan so that uh, it's able to continue hanging out until XTRG decides to uh, give it a serious effort. It's not worth a lot of assault or a lot of uh, victory points, but it does at least tie down a substantial number of his troops there. You can see he's got 14 units, 51,000 troops, all in Clark Field, so he's not able to deploy most of those troops elsewhere uh, as long as we have our troops in their current positions. Uh, we've already kind of looked at Singapore, so that's the situation there. At Rangoon, we're unloading a large number of supplies. We've got 60,000 fuel and 68,000 um, supplies at Rangoon right now. Uh, we've got uh, 374 assault value there. We're building up defenses there. We're building up uh, the fortifications there. Where are these guys going? Nowhere. All these guys are in Rangoon. Why can't we... Uh... All right, 13th Indian Brigade. There you go. So we just built the 13th Indian Brigade, which gives us a little bit more efficiency here. Um, it also can be part of the 1st Burma Division. Uh, which we have almost all the forces we need for that. So everybody's either located at Rangoon or Pegu, um, with the exception of these guys who are at Tai or Tuang Goi. Um, first Burma Brigade. So I'm actually going to move these guys back here. Once they're at Metallica, then we're going to go ahead and rail them to Pegu, uh, and we're going to build the first Burma Division at Pegu. Uh, so we're really trying to be as efficient as we can. I think we're going to put the 1st Division at Pegu. We're going to put the 18th British Infantry Division at Tuai Gai. Uh, and then uh, we'll see what we do with the rest of our troops there. Because um, essentially I'm bringing some reinforcements in from India as well in Burma to make sure that we have a strong force here. So um, I'm bringing in the 63rd Indian Brigade, which is already part of Burma Command. So it's already within that headquarters unit. They're marching to Pegu. It's going to take a while to get there, probably a couple of months till they can get into India. Additionally, the 18th Indian or British Infantry Division, which is also in the 3rd Indian Corps, it's an unrestricted corps, uh, 444 assault value, good morale, um, not great experience, but they're, it's a very good unit. Uh, they're moving toward uh, Metallica, uh, and so our defensive of Burma is going to really focus on a division at Tai Gai, which will probably be the British, and then we'll put a Indian Br Division and a Burma Division at Pegu. Uh, and so the southern flank should be defended. Additionally, we can always at the British units at Taigai, if we don't see any uh, Japanese reinforcements coming in that direction, we can always rail them to Pegu as well uh, and really have a substantial force of almost a 1,000 assault value here. I don't think there is a risk to Burma for the next couple of weeks. I don't think there's any risk there until Singapore falls. Uh, he has moved one unit here uh, between Pegu and between Molman. Uh, we do have some battalions here, some troops that are, uh, in theory, cut off uh, from uh, reinforcements. But uh, at the moment, anyway, it's not too concerning. I could pull the troops of Molman out via, via sea, uh, 
Uh, but I also don't want to get more troop transports sunk, and he's already bombed us there a bit. So we are unloading a bunch of supply at Rangoon. We have 68,000 supply there. We've got another seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 unloading on transports. Uh, one other thing that Belugan told me is that you really want to load Rangoon up with supply because if you have a ton of supply at Rangoon, it actually eventually filters through to China as well, excluding the whole China, the Burma Road thing that just automatically gives you supply into China. As long as you hold that defensive line, um, China will actually get supplies from Rangoon as well if you if you build up excess numbers of, of supply there. Meanwhile, Changsha got bombarded last turn. We strategically moved in an infantry corps here, so another 187 uh, troops. They're going to start unloading off of their uh, their troop cars here, so it'll take two days for the 187 AV of the 63rd Chinese Corps to be there. But that does bring us up to 2,400 strength. Changsha also has level 4 fortifications. We presume he's going to start bombing Changsha heavily. We have our own aircraft here, so we're actually going to launch an airstrike against the Japanese troops with some of our own aircraft. Uh, but then we're also going to have these 30 uh, flying tigers are going to be flying long-range cap over Changsha, but we're going to be waiting on that this turn because I did just move them uh, into Changte, and uh, in doing so, one of them suffered really high fatigue penalties of 49. So we're going to give it a day before we, uh, before we bring that cap in. No real change in northern China. Troops kind of moving around there. Uh, no real change in southern China at the moment. Troops moving around there. Um, these troops here cross this river here. About 1,200 assault value troops over here uh, did cross a river. Uh, and uh, they're moving back toward uh, Henang, and then they may move to Changsha if necessary to improve the uh, defenses there. Uh, I'm debating moving him toward Kanxian. Uh, I don't know how you pronounce that, but I don't have any recon on, like, if there's anything there. I don't think any of my aircraft have substantial range to get there. I guess we could. There is one A-29 in this squadron. So why don't we set this group here to, to recon at Kensign? Because if there is nothing here, I'd gladly move some of those troops down there to take that, that city back from the Japanese. Uh, 20 victory points would be denied to the Japanese. It also might throw some of their southern operations into into chaos, especially if they don't have a ton of Kukong. Um, so we'll have to see. Garrison level there's 20. There's no garrison level at Kensign, so uh, it might be something they'd be less likely to garrison. We also have this 21st Chinese Corps, which is marching east to Wang Chao to try and cut the Japanese troops off who are in the city. They have 41,000 troops there. They would, might actually take the city if they attack it now. Uh, I'm not sure. But we did get the fortifications back up to level 2. Uh, I just noticed that now. So uh, if uh, if the Japanese attack, they may get a bloody nose or maybe not. I'm not really sure. Our troops are uh, are getting battered a bit, but it uh, seems like they're actually okay. Fatigue level 3, disruption 0 for the 100th Chinese Infantry Corps. That's the main defensive force, the 14th Base Force. A lot of disruption, uh, but, um, you know, uh, they are what they are. 86th Chinese Corps is mostly destroyed or disrupted, uh, so there's that. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, that's the situation right there. Bataan, nothing going on. Singapore, not a lot going on. Uh, we're moving a lot of reinforcements and units around. I'm trying to get uh, some additional troops into Australia to strengthen the defenses there in the event that uh, exterior G moves for Australia. So the 19th, 17th, 16th Australian Brigades and the 6th Australian Cavalry Regiment are all part of the 6th Australian Division, which we're going to go ahead and rebuild now. So you can see that just consolidated all those troops into the strongest division we might have on the map right now, 478 uh, assault value. Very good experience. These guys are crack troops out of the desert. 72 experience, 74 morale. Uh, these guys are crack troops. I want to get them to Australia because if he does move on Australia, then I want to make sure I've got at least one crack unit rather than militia units. Uh, but I don't have any troop transports there, so they're on the way. Um, we're still moving the, uh, the carrier and the battleship into the Pacific, uh, actually into the Arabian Sea first. Um, they're two days off till they're off map. Uh, we're bringing in various new resupply convoys. I've set up a couple of convoys here, uh, cargo convoys that are all going to be going to uh, Rangoon to pour more supplies in there. Um, if we take a look at the Repulse, we'll see where she's at in terms of her repairs. She's got 107 days left. They're working at uh, normal pace. Can we speed things up at all? No, can't. So we'll keep it normal pace, 107 days, 17 major flood damage, 16 major engine damage, 24 system damage. Uh, they're working on it. And uh, again, in 
just over three months. Uh, she'll be ready to go back to sea. No upgrade for her. So, you know, uh, three months. Um, that also coincides with some other, other time frames for some other ships. Uh, the West Virginia is about five months away, but she'll have another 20 days because we're going to upgrade her as soon as she's done. Um, so that'll be that. Uh, additionally, the uh, battleship down here at San Diego, the Pennsylvania, this is going to be ready in about six months. Uh, still repairing from its damage at Pearl Harbor, uh, but it's actually going to be seven months when we do the upgrade because there's a 20-day time period on that. We've got the two battleships in San Francisco. We've got the Maryland and the Arizona. The Maryland is actually only two months out, but probably three when we say we're going to wait to upgrade her because that gives her radar and all of those other things, which will be very nice. Um, we do have two battleships that are about ready for sea. We've got uh, the Colorado, which is actually not damaged at Pearl Harbor at all, but was just undergoing its 1942 upgrade and has surface search and air search radar that will be given to it, so that will make it more effective there. Uh, and that will be coming online in four days. In addition to that, we also already have the War Spite, uh, which is a uh, British battleship, already has radar, 15-inch guns of the Queen Elizabeth class. She's ready to go. We're waiting for the Colorado to be ready before we move her. Additionally, we're going to be pulling out some uh, Canadian troops out of Victoria on Vancouver Island. We're pulling back the Brockville Rifles Battalion and the Edmonton Fusiliers Battalion, who switched both of these to the Southwest Pacific and spent some political action points there. We're going to spend some on the 2nd Canadian Scots Battalion as well. I don't have enough to do it right now, but in a couple of days I will. And once we do all of that, we will have the forces we need to combine the Brockville Rifles, the Canadian Scots, the Brockville Rifles, and the Edmonton Fusiliers all into uh, a single brigade, the Canadian 13th Brigade. And these troops are not super experienced. You can see 42, 10, 42, 10. So they're not experienced. They don't have great morale. But it will be a modern, you know, regular... Uh, actually, shit, they're Canadian. They're Canadian militia. God damn it. I thought there were more than that. But in any event, it'll be a hundred and something assault value unit that we will then move. We're, we're transporting them one by one via a single transport at Victoria down to Seattle. From there, they're going to rail to San Diego and they'll join the forces there uh, in moving toward somewhere in the South Pacific. I may move them to Christmas Island, which I think Christmas Island is going to be my, my main new staging point. With all the subs he has hanging around at Pearl Harbor and with the, the target that we know that Pearl Harbor is, I've directed some of my convoys to move back to Christmas Island where we've got 8,000 fuel and we've got another 11,000 fuel on the way. So I'm trying to build Christmas Island up into something a little bit more than, than what it is right now. You can see we're expanding the port there. Um, and so what I'd like to do is use this as a key uh, base in our South Pacific Island chain uh, to kind of direct various convoys and routes and whatnot. So to that extent, we may send the Canadian militia there to reinforce the Christmas Island engineer unit there, which is, is pretty pretty limited there. So um, we need reinforcements for Christmas Island. Uh, we could could send those engineers who are bound for New Zealand there, but I think New Zealand's more on the front lines. Um, we might send like a, an infantry battalion here or an engineer regiment, a U.S. Uh, Marine Corps engineer regiment, uh, maybe uh, to Christmas Island instead. Uh, but in any event, we need to build Christmas Island up as well. Um, so right now, our concern mainly is in the South Pacific. What's he going to do after New Caledonia? What's he going to do? Is he going to go for Fiji? Is he going to go for Australia? Is he going to go toward the target that really scares me, which is New Zealand, um, just because it's so poorly defended? Um, is he going to turn west and go for New Guinea? We don't know yet. Um, we have a couple of light cruisers here that were headed toward Rabaul, but he's detected them. They're at level 10 detection. We do know his air cover can reach as far south as Rabaul from truck. And so what we're going... Are, they're level 2 detection, actually. Huh. Maybe we'll alter this. I was going to have them sprint away through the southern gap here. But uh, if they're not as well detected, maybe we'll still have them go toward Rabaul. I'm not sure. Um, we're building up fortifications here. We have uh, 28,000 fuel just leaving Oosthaven. We've got another cargo uh, task force here uh, at Oosthaven that's just docking up and is starting to load up. Uh, can pull another 26,000 fuel out of the province. Uh, we have a lot of fuel on the way toward Perth, um, I think. 25,000 here. Nothing here. These guys are going back to Oosthaven. These guys are going to Aden with all of those troop transports. 
These guys are going to Palm Bank. So 25,000, 17,000. Uh, that brings to 42,000. We've got 21,000 here, which brings us to 63,000. Uh, I'm not going to count the oil there. Uh, 16,000 in that group brings us to 79,000. And then if we include the uh, 1,600, or sorry, uh, the 7,000 fuel here, that brings us to 86,000 additional fuel on the way to Perth to help the Australian economy to ensure that we have sufficient supply in Australia. Additionally to that, uh, we have 31,700 fuel unloading at Townsville, so it puts us over 100,000 fuel in the next week that's going to be pouring into Sydney, both helping our naval movements, but also helping in the creation of vast quantities of supply uh, that can be created for the economy there and to fuel the troops there. And eventually, if there's an invasion of Australia, that'll all come in handy. So that's the situation right now. Um, you know, uh, I don't have a lot else to say about this turn. It was kind of a lot of me hypothesizing on, on my biggest fear. Uh, it didn't look like he lost a ton of aircraft. He lost seven ops losses. We lost five, uh, two air. Uh, we lost some 139s. He lost a few Sallies. Uh, lost a couple of Catalinas. Uh, and that's sort of the situation right now. Interestingly enough, we've actually shot down more Japanese than we have lost. Um, so that's cool. Uh, ship availability, anything, anything coming up? What's coming up here? I mean, obviously there's stuff. Most of it's usually merchant ships. Um, a couple of battleships coming to San Francisco in the next two days, the Mississippi and the, uh, New Mexico. That'll be interesting. Uh, troop transport to Los Angeles in three days. Some subs in five. Dutch cruiser Sumatra in seven. Idaho in 11 days to San Francisco. So we'll have three battleships coming in the next two weeks. British tanker to Aden. Revenge. Yeah, okay. So not a lot uh, about to come in terms of carriers. We're still 50 days away from the Hornet showing up. 54 for the formidable. Illustrious is April 28th. Wasp is June 10th. Uh, and then nothing till 43. Um, cruisers, anything? Yeah. Okay. So that's the situation right now, guys. Um, ground units, reinforcements, those will probably be the most important. What do we, when do we get those? We get two infantry regiments assigned to the Pacific Fleet, both arriving in the eastern U.S. base in the next two days. So that'll be nice. The 132nd Infantry Regiment and the uh, 182nd Infantry Regiment, uh, both arriving in the eastern U.S., both attached to the Pacific Fleet, uh, and actually the 754th Tank Battalion, the 70th Coastal AA, um, the 8 10th uh, and 811th Engineer Aviation Brigades, these will all be very useful in sending some troops to some of these Pacific Islands uh, to reinforce them. Maybe the 132nd will go toward um, Christmas Island. Maybe the 182nd will go somewhere else. Um, but all good news. Uh, that's another 200-plus assault value that we're going to be getting from fresh troops of ours, which will be awesome. Uh, some construction arrangements in the Southwest Pacific. Uh, in about a week, we'll get some coastal defense guns in the South Pacific. Uh, new Chinese units arriving in 10 days in Chongqing. That might have been a core that was already destroyed. Uh, Madras, we get the 23rd Infantry Division here in 12 days. Um, another Chinese Corps. 2nd Marine Raider Regiment and 3rd Marine Raider Regiment, both arriving in the U.S., uh, one of them is assigned to the West Coast, uh, restricted. Uh, the 18th Australian Brigade will arrive in about three weeks. 24th also. That one's arriving in Aden. 25th is also arriving in Aden. I wonder if that's part of another Australian Infantry Division. These guys are going to be another crack unit, though, because you can see 70 experience. So getting more Australian reinforcements in three weeks. So I think the door is closing on any realistic invasion of Australia with all these Australian reinforcements that are coming up. Um, so really it comes down to, is he going to shift east? Is he going to try and pick up his victory points at Fiji and Pago? Pago is not really worth a lot. Probably lose more victory points. Oh, actually, it's worth 150. Never mind. Um, Fiji is worth a lot. Um, so is he going to go for Suva and is he going to go for Pago, the the more obvious targets? Is he going to go for Australia, which would be just nutso bongers, you're dumb? Or is he going to go for New Zealand, which would probably be his best opportunity, to be honest? Um, meanwhile, 
Uh, we'll have to see what happens at Patan. We'll have to see what happens on the Dutch East Indies. I still can't believe that he hasn't gone for any of the oil or fuel there. We've sucked a lot of that away. That's going to hurt him when the time comes, I think. Uh, and we're also repositioning a lot of our subs. So I've issued a lot of orders to these subs to get down here by truck and uh, to start uh, intercepting Japanese shipping convoys down there. So... Um, that is something that we are doing. Um, with that being said, guys, I think that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, I appreciate you listening to me ramble of my hopes and dreams and fears. And uh, we'll sign off here. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.